It's okay. Yeah, no doubt. Click on the button. It's too late. We're doing it. All right. Got my notes. Here we go. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance, Weekly Scrap, number 128. My guest this fine evening is Nick Esposito. He is a second-generation firefighter who started his fire service career in 1989. Um, in 1999, he was hired by Bridgeport, Connecticut Fire Department and has worked his way up through the ranks, taking on many line staff functions. Currently, the captain of their rescue company, Nick is the owner of Truck Tactics Training and teaches on regional, national level. You can find him sharing knowledge of building construction, truck tactics, anything he's passionate about all over the interwebs on his Facebook, Instagram pages under truck underscore tactics, as well as trucktactics.org. He's the co-founder of the Facebook page, Truck Floor Training, where he gets to spread his passion. I'm lucky to have him on the scrap. So, Nick Esposito, welcome to scrap number 128. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Really cool. Very honored. Got very hyped up. Here we go. Anything I missed in the intro? Anything you would like to add? Uh, Nope. All good. Uh, Proud husband and father. Man, I forgot. Hold on. Let me pull this up here. I'm pulling up my drive. Give me one second. This is on yeah, me. No. This is on me, sure. not you. That's all right. No worries. <laughs> Firehouse vigilance, weekly scrap. It's been a. It's been a. This is what I will say in my defense. It's been a hectic weekend. I I was supposed to be in Orlando for Orlando Fire Conference. An ice storm hit the Oklahoma area. I did not get to make it there, so I apologize to everybody. And then over the weekend, and then I caught uh, Anthony Castro teaching his class on command. Uh, and I came home and rushed home to get the scrap going and I did not even get Kyle Romagus involved, which is, oh, okay. which is my bad. And I feel terrible. So I'm, if he's around, I'm just like completely, uh, getting it up just in case I am, am my fault. Okay. So all that being said, here we go. Cool. Comments, moderation. We're ready. <laughs> There we go. Throwing the first question at you, Nick, if you're ready. Taking training from the what and how and advancing to the when and the why. So <clears throat> I think our uh, big problem that we have in the fire service today, and I think it's what we've kind of been led up to believe is the way to, to do it. And then I think our JPR checkbox culture of, of trying to get folks checked off has really led us into a, a place where we're, we're so much more concerned with that they're doing things that they have no idea why they're doing things. Like we never teach them that. We're, we're just teaching like, you know, when education was a big thing at, at the national level um, and, and they said, oh, you're teaching to the standard or, or whatever. You're teaching to the test, excuse me. And I think that's what we're doing in, in our um, our fire service training as well. So, you know, you say, hey, okay, look, we're going to go out and throw a 24-foot ladder and this is how you do it. And then they go out, and if you're training places like everybody else's, this ground's all the concrete's all scuffed up where they've been throwing 24s for 10 years now. So there's no thought, you know, going involved in any of sure. it. And it's just a matter of, geez, I hope the kid doesn't drop the ladder on his head or her head. And then when they do it, you just check the box and you move on. But we never really talk about when you're supposed to throw this ladder or why we're throwing this ladder or, you know, what's next. So, you know, a lot of times, even just with efficiency, throwing a ladder, you know, if it takes them a minute or two minutes and then they do it great, they think they're they're good at throwing ladders and then they get a break. But the reality is that throwing the ladder only allows us to go and do the work that we're supposed to do. So if we're supposed to go to a second floor window, third floor window and, and either do VES or search or or whatever, bring up a line, you know, that's another whole thing. And, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, if we don't really give the, our folks the when and the why, they're missing out. And I think when we, we, we get them on the line, you know, the, the line folks are upset because these new people don't really have that put together yet. The, the, when am I supposed to do this? Why am I doing it now? Why wouldn't I do it earlier? Why wouldn't I do it later? Right. Um, and I really think that's that's what we need to get into more. And, and um, you know, it's just a matter of, really explaining what we're doing instead of just teaching skills. Now, what do you think was the germ of it? Like if you went back and like, you've been doing this a while and that's no, no disrespect and in, 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 in reverence to your age, 
like I'm 51. I'm I, I own it whether I want dude, to. Dude, I'm, I'm getting ready to be 46, and I was like, man, there's yeah. nothing good about getting old. I don't know what people think, you know. But no, uh, um, but but wisdom comes with it. So, what do you think is the germ of that? Like the moving towards the 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 losing of the understanding of why we do what we do. You know, when I first started, I grew up in New York State just north of New York City, and um, the Essentials of Firemanship was a 39-hour program. And the most, like, thing that I learned that I thought I would never really apply or needed to, to learn all that stuff was how to use a fire extinguisher. Pull, aim, squeeze, sweep, got it. Let's move on. Pass. Now, you know, one of your other guests talked about it a few weeks ago. You know, the ERG hazmat, um, you know, all this crazy stuff. There's There's way too much time put into some of these things. And I understand federal funding and whatnot, but, you know, a, a Fire One program has a ton of hours and a lot of them are not relevant. And that's the problem. So, you know, if we can check a box, building instruction, particularly, you know, these skills of throwing ladders. I understand we teach people how to throw ladders in a safe way because maybe they've never thrown a ladder before, but we don't teach them a relevant or practical way that they're going to be able to apply on the fire ground. And I think that's why specifically with ground ladders, that's why a lot of the folks that come out kind of suck at it. And that's also why a lot of the the people that, unless they are on a company or in a department that has a ladder culture, they're terrible at throwing ladders too, because they've learned all this craziness, you know, kneel on your, th- this knee to raise with, uh, you know, that shoulder and spin this way and, and do your commands and cover the butt and say you're wheeling right. And, and all, nobody has time for that when they're too busy trying to figure out where to throw the ladder. So none of the good skills get reinforced because none of the good skills were actually even taught. And that's, that's a big part of the problem. I think. Do you have a, man, I'm, I'm, I, this, uh, like this fascinates me. I really do mean this. Do you have a theory on how we can get back to getting to what matters and getting away from the, uh, the, is it hourly requirements or checkbox requirements or this all hazards, uh, loss of focus? I, I, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to word it in the right way, but I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's a, it's a couple, a couple different problems. One is that we, we've embraced um, the belief that by regulating or requiring documentation that we're going to be better, safer, faster, or not even faster. They don't even care about that, but we're, we're liability conscious. And, and I really think specifically with ground ladders that we, we teach people how to throw ground ladders so the fire academy doesn't get sued because people might get hurt. Um, wow. wow. I teach a class called Ground Ladders After the Fire Academy that um, I like to think that it's still a very safe program, but we strip it down and we get rid of a lot of the other stuff. And and what we do before we start is we really embrace that when and why. So mm. that way folks really understand what we're trying to accomplish and the, the severity of the fact that if you drop a, a 24, 28 or a 35 on somebody, they're going to get hurt for a long time. And so... Um, we can trust these, these folks to do what we need them to do if we give them the information. And so I really do believe that we kind of have to, we need to vet our fire instructors and then we have to kind of set them free and let them do the good work. And if, if we, we teach or, or we have these institutions that, that are so afraid of getting sued, then, then we need to look at some other things. Like, how are we bringing in our best people to be firefighters? Um, or are we preparing our people in a way to be our best firefighters? It's, it's a tough thing. You know, I, I think that everything is, is so hyper-focused on, you know, um, it doesn't meet a standard. Is it NFPA? Is it, does our, do we look like the, book, the picture in the IFSTA book? I mean, <laughs> no it's doubt. just bananas and is, is it is it you. just the, the just the just the sheer fear of liability and training from a point of fear well and again i'm not asking you to paint the entire fire service with one giant brush but you know i think um you know i, I think what's what's happened is that uh, fire academies schools um are teaching to a baseline and the baseline that they use is the ifsta and that's off of the the nfpa and i think if if the NFPA had some interpretations with it to allow it to be viewed as a little bit more practical um, application, I think maybe then the IFSTA books wouldn't be so damning. And I, I think that would allow folks to, to, to move beyond this rigid robotic JPR 
um, and still put out a very good, safe, productive product, but make it very practical instead. Right, right. No, it's beautiful. Um, I'm going to read you some comments just coming at you. Andrew McGinn said, let's go. Zach Hal sent 200 stars. I, I, everybody in the audience, I learned how to mute the ding from the stars. That's been a oh. thing. That's been a thing for people who listen only to the audio, who don't yeah. understand why the arcade sounds are popping. Finally figured out how to do it. So I appreciate the stars. Don't get me wrong, but got rid of the sounds. Um, John Hawking said complacent training makes complacent firefighters. I can't agree more. I would agree. Um, I do think our structure is inherently flawed. I Preach. think the, the structure of the American Fire Service training programs are, are inherently flawed. Go. That's me. Go. No, if you want to expound on that, I want to hear it. I think our audience wants to hear it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, you know, um, I think Shoop said it. All firefighting is local. So what works for me in an old mill town in New England may not be practical in a, you know, in, in L.A. or in, in some place in New Mexico or Montana. Or my um, suburbia. Yeah. yeah, and and I think that instructors should have the latitude to to make the training relevant, and I I think that we shouldn't be so. Um, look, the standards a minimum, and man, I don't think there's one person out there that'll that'll champion the minimum that we've been shooting to. So why not allow your your local folks to enhance the program to make it work for their people and to make it relevant and 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 effective when they leave that's that's kind of how i see it you know no and and dave mcgrill says we're, we're great at eating our young and ignoring our old and i, I might butcher his quote but but that's what the fire service yeah. is really good at and um how do we get to embrace our you know the people that have that knowledge of like like you say old new england milltown you got guys on your department yourself included but the guys on your town have, how come some of them leave and, and take that with them rather than feeling like they have something to offer it's um, it's an onion and you start to unpeel it and it gets pretty crazy. No doubt. Right. Um, I, I think that um, if we embrace a mindset where it is more than okay to fail in training and then we learn and grow from that, I think it'll allow a lot of folks to kind of let their guard down mm. and, and be happy with an environment that's not perfect and also not be so afraid to show people that maybe they're not as good as, you know, they're, they're trying to, for some reason, have a false bravado or whatever. It's, it's just very difficult. I, I think we have a lot of institutional problems uh, across the fire service. Um, I think certain regions um, embrace this checkbox championing where others, I think, are better at, um, you know, looking past it. You know, I think, unfortunately, it's 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 been talked about here. You know, I'm going to teach you this way because that's the way the book says, because the guy out in the hallway wants to make sure that I, I check this box. But then when he goes for lunch, we're going to do it my way. And I think we need to bridge that somehow, because I'm not saying that either are wrong, but one is not right. And one is 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 so bad that it shouldn't be talked about because um you know, we, we do a lot of things in my, my department that don't necessarily mirror the state curriculum and, and it's, it is what it is, but you know, they're both good, I guess, but they're, they both could be very better, very, very much improved. Anyway. <laughs> oh yeah. We got lots of room. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm only drinking water tonight. So, but yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I am not, I got my, my, there you go. My non-sponsored, yeah. uh, favorite yeah, beer, we, yeah get on that you know someday um yeah. but no uh i i firmly believe this statement i say this statement over and over and i, I say it every class i teach generally speaking is if you ever say i'm going to teach you the way the book says then i'm going to teach you how we really do it then you are part of the problem now i don't know if that's too harsh of a metric or anything like that what do you think of that statement so I, i'll say this i'll i'll say that i they are part of the problem, but the problem exists and they're trying to make it productive. And so, um, look, the IFSTA, the, the NFPA curriculum is what it is. And there's some dumb things. We're still doing water shoots and, and crazy crap like that. You know, um, you know, it's, it's just not practical. 
But if if the book requires you to, or if, if it requires you to do a certain way, because you know that that silly JPR is hanging over your head, then you know you almost have to say, "Look, I, I've got to teach you this." No, no, it's, it's a hell. trap. I, I, again, it's a trap. I, I, yeah, everybody can't be uh, William Wallace, you know, yelling freedom. Uh, right. Well, you know, and and so to that point, like I, you know, I used to teach locally the the fire ones fire twos and i i just can't do it anymore god bless them they're 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 doing good work i, I just can't to me i, I just can't do it mm -hmm. no well which, and, and so so which actually, to my quote means you're no longer part of the problem right but i quit so is that the answer? Yeah, no, no, that's it. Uh, yeah, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for your know. answer. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. Okay, let me throw some stuff at you. We got some. Uh, we we we've, we've sparked a lot of discussion here, so let me throw it at you. Uh, question: Nick just mentioned this was a while back, but he just mentioned vet instructors. Details of what that is. Does he mean you need to vet your instructors? Chad, you may have to expound on your question. I'm sorry. I'll come back to it. Yeah, I, I, I believe that fire academies should vet their instructors. I think it's important that, um, you know, I guess specifically, not everybody should teach everything. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So if, if you're, you, you know, you're in an environment where you've never cut a pitched roof, then why are you teaching ventilation? If you've never, you know even just hooked up at a high rise. Why are you teaching that? I, right. I mean, it, there's things, listen, I'm not a code guy. I don't, I won't, I've, I've reset pr plenty of alarms in my life, but I won't teach it because I don't know how that stuff works. Right. You know, I, it's, so there's other people that are, that are much more attuned to how those, those things work and, and let them do that hazmat. I won't teach it because I'm not a hazmat guy, but I know that there's people out there that because they see, Oh, I, I'm not doing anything on Tuesday afternoon. And oh, there's a whatever class I, I'll teach that it's, it's, that's inexcusable. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't ask a, a, an instructor. I, w I wouldn't sit, take a class say on extrication from somebody that's never like actually done it. Never cut a car. You know? Yeah. No. Some 100%. of your best fire instructors are, are the firefighters, but some of your most enthusiastic people are your fire officers. And I'm not saying that as a, with a broad brush, but, you know, so we'll have fire officers teach stuff and they haven't touched the hearse tool in five, eight, ten years. Well, why are they teaching an extrication class? Right. They know what they want as the result. But if you can't teach somebody how to do the steps to get to that result, then you have no business teaching it. That's that's what I mean by vetting. No, no, that's beautiful, and, that, and everybody yeah. should, and I love it. Um, I don't know if you know a guy named David Lennart, Lennart? <laughs> but he said, I, I, I think it's an inside joke, but he said, fire Yoda. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's, uh, yeah. Fair I enough. I love David. Thank, thank you, David. Okay. I didn't know. I, <laughs> you get a sense of when these things are inside jokes. No, he, I know. He's, he's a good dude. And okay. He, yeah, he's a big Star Wars guy. And okay. Every time I post something, he puts a picture of – he took my picture and put the face of Yoda on my picture. So it's got my fire helmet with Yoda on it. Nice. My, okay. Well, so. I'll tell uh, David that I uh, try not to deal in absolutes because I am not a Sith. So that's my little Star Wars nod. All right. There you go. Jo uh, John Shersted, thank you for the pronunciation. 20 years ago in my fire academy, we were smart asses and had T-shirts made that said, different day, different way. Now I understand that the instructors were sharing experience. So that is a, yeah, that kind of get, ties right into what we were talking about. Tony Nunez said minimum standards are too minimum. Definitely needs to be updated. Well, I think too, just, just with that, go with it. Not only are they minimum, but in, in many places are not even binding. And, and let's be real about it. Like I, you know, I, I proctored a fire two one time and vehicle extrication is one of the skills. And I watched a, a student struggle for 20 minutes to get a door open. And um, he got the door open, but I failed him. And then I, I got in trouble because I failed him. And I said, well, what good was it to, to, to have a student take 20 minutes to get a door open that he easily could have done five or seven or nine other maneuvers to get that open in less than two minutes? And they said, well, it doesn't matter because he got the door open and that's the skill. Okay. And that's that was part of my frustration. Why. Part of the reason why you don't do it anymore. Yeah, it's that's not practical to me. It's 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 a disservice to everybody. No, no, without a doubt, man. And and the frustration 
you know, and it, it, that's what we're talking about. I don't even know how we got on this conversation, but it, we're, I'm yeah, definitely okay. enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nature of the Beast, Christopher Dale Moore said, uh, I'm going through here. I'm looking, I'm catching up. Um, Brian Irwin said, the taking with us culture is changing rapidly due to the exact platform. Being able to listen to and see more via social media has energized the fire service teaching. How do you feel about the effect that social, I mean, obviously you're involved in social media, but how do you feel about social media training and the fire service? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's great. Um, I think that um, in the beginning, I think that not a lot of people were into it. So I think there was a lot of folks hanging their shingle out there and saying stuff. And look, somebody could say I'm full of BS. And that's that's cool because um, you want that challenge and you want to like check yourself often. But, um, you know, social media has given people access to information, education, um, a, a certain level of camaraderie that they may not get in their own place. And um, if I can, if I can find a subject matter expert, you know, um, that's really good at say vehicle stabilization and I don't have certain tools that they have, why are they using that tool? And I can reach out to those people and then at least get the information. And, and then I think that it takes a certain level of understanding to say, this is just information. This isn't like, the way and and then from there use that to further my exploration into the topic and then get more information and then really again all, like we said before all firefighting is local take that information how does it apply to me does it yes. apply to me okay yeah i think it can or no it's not relevant um but yeah i mean i think the access is great i think you know um it's it's really allowed a lot of people to 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 seek out a lot of people and, and really, as a whole, I think it's really upped the stock of the fire service. On the whole, I agree. Uh, I had a I had a chief tell me one time in, in a conversation that nowadays it's so easy to get on Facebook or social media and be an expert when you know nothing and no one can. And 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 I was like, yeah, you're right. That is, you know, at the time in, in the conversation. And then later on, I looked at it and I was thinking about it. And this is my take. And I want to see what you think, which is. Actually, with the sheer amount of vetting that goes on, like if you are full of crap, it gets called pretty damn quick. <clears throat> it does. And and um, so it, it, it's really good. And it's 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 it also has its negative effects. So what's there's nothing better than and I, you know, I don't troll people. I don't like trolls. But when somebody puts something out there and they act like they're the expert and then they get you know, oh. a handful of people that, you know, absolutely know what they're talking about. It, it really is kind of nice to see because maybe, you know, I mean, that's always been the, the complaint about the magazines. OK, somebody from somewhere wrote an article about something, but because it's in the magazine, it must be true. Right. But in, in, the, in the interwebs today, that's just not the case. Um, somebody could put something out there and um, and, and they're going to get hit if 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 the folks don't like it and there's enough folks out there. Um, you know, it, in the beginning of the social media, I think that it, that was the case where right. anybody right. could put something up and, and it took a little while. Um, and I think honestly, as an example, one of the frustrations, as much as I have embraced the UL, all of that science in the very beginning, some of the information, the way it came out. Was, Slicers. Yeah. Y yeah. <laughs> and then even after that, and, and so a couple people that that kind of had some computer skills that could kind of make a, a slick and flashy page looked very, you know, um, competent and, and, and relevant. But but as we've gone through the the further uh, information that's come out with the UL, suddenly they've changed their direction because they've been been outed as as just being wrong. So um, I, I think it does have value. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it, man. I think we're on a question one still. Just so just to keep track. Um let me catch you up. I Matthew Billitz uh Biltz, sorry, brother. I'd rather have the instructors in the academy that say this is what I have to teach you for the test, but this is how you're really going to do it, rather than be taught just for the ifs to firefighter one way and not be competent. But it oh, needs absolutely. it needs to come from competent firefighters. That's a great take, brother. I do I do feel that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Eric Stephan said, Stephen, Stephan, 
It's the mentality of being okay with just being okay at the job. It kills most of what we, those who love the job, are trying to do. Brother, you just did the definition of complacency. And, you know, I, I hate complacency. Um, Brandon Lane said, thank you both for your contributions to the service. Crap gets called. That's the truth. And that catches, uh, Ro, Ro, or last one, Ramon, Ramon Joyce. Nowadays, talking to the old heads in the department, we train for almost a static situation rather than a dynamic setting like we are always in. I am nothing more than a rookie in this service. Wow, he wrote a novel for me. I'm sorry, I'm trying to catch you. That's a lot. Okay, sorry, I can't read it all. That's a very real, That's a very good point, though, that first go, little bit. Go, go. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of value in what he just said there. So, yeah, right on. <sighs> Beautiful. And Ramon, if you get more succinct, I will read more of your question. I promise you. <laughs> Put a like. Um, are you an advocate? Amanda Miller wants to know. Are you an advocate of incorporating a 24-hour shift during academies? Well, I, I think it's a neat idea. I know that some places do it. Um, my my place doesn't do it. Um, I, I do believe that there, there could be value in that. I think what it would do is it would certainly allow folks to hit the ground running a little bit better. Um, I think what it would also do is um, it's, it would kind of like really garner some interest. And, and also um, there's uh, uh, ramifications to not knowing what you're doing if you're just turned into a JPR champ. And so if, if you know, regardless of how much you've been – working hard or not working so hard or whatever in the academy if you know that there's a a 24-hour shift where you're going to face a car wreck and a fire and some you know other you know pub edge or whatever you're going to do then it's going to i think make you a little bit more focused and and i think yeah that's that's a great way to 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 get people ready without um having them experience that 24 is their first shift on the line it's pretty good no it is no and i will i will chime in which is my son just completed academy and everybody knows he's at okc and all that stuff and they do a 24-hour shift during their training academy it's kind of the culmination of their whole academy after the 16 weeks they do what's called eudcm which is a latin word for like the trial or, or or something so don't quote me on my latin but um i can say this the pride he took in that 24-hour shift the uh over the years watching that uh 24 hour shift grow into the different challenge. They go from everything from car war, uh, car wrecks, EMS calls. They go do inspections. They don't go flow hydrants. They do inspections. Um, it's crazy. All the stuff they do in that 24 hour period, they cook. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. It's beautiful. And honestly, you know, for some people that might be the first time they didn't sleep in their own house. Right. So, Especially nowadays, man. I mean, it's yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just crazy that, like, we had one guy, it's the first time he ever had a, a pea for, in dinner, a P-E-A, a pea, right? A green vegetable on his plate. And it, it's like, really, dude? Like, how old are you? <laughs> now, never I will, had peas before. I'll say this. So, yeah. My son's academy was 63 members, so they have a lot of options. The last academy we graduated at my department was three three people going on shift. Oh, okay. And so, I don't know what you do with 20, 24 hours with three people. You know, they're going to be exhausted if, you, yeah. if you're throwing it at them. So, right. again, it comes down to the resources available to you that I think there's massive value to it. Yeah. All right. Nick, you are a gracious guest as I pull up. I love this quote that you sent me. And it is, encourage results-oriented fire ground performance versus process-oriented. Right. So, I mean, it kind of goes with what we were just talking about with the education. Um, what I will say, too, is that I am older, so I got into the fire service in the 80s. My father was also in the fire service from the 70s to the 80s. And that was a big part of the 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 upwelling of policy and SOP and accountability and incident command. And everybody was so concerned, once again, with checking boxes that they almost didn't care about what it looked like when it came out the other side. And so I think there's still some of that left over today where you get supervisors that, you know, if you don't do A, then B, then C, then D, you're in trouble. But for me as a supervisor, like, I don't care how you get there. Right as on. long as you get there in a safe and timely manner that's productive and fits the needs of the rest of the fire ground and then gives us the results that we need. Right. And so, you know, for me, I, I really almost don't care about the process because that just stifles creativity 
Um, it stifles um, somebody's ability to adjust based upon the needs of the situation. The fire scene is very dynamic. Emergency scenes are very dynamic. And so if I have somebody who's trying to find a way to put in part C just so they can say they did it to get to the end, that's it's not productive uh, for me or for anybody. And so um, I, I think, too, what what it turns into is that people get mad because, oh, that, that person doesn't know what the hell they're doing. They did it wrong. Well, did, did you get what you needed? Well, yeah, but he did it wrong. But did he or did she? Right. Right. And that's the point. Like, let's let's focus more on the results. Yeah. I mean, I think if we prepare our people um, and train them the way that we want them to act and and to perform, then we will get activities done the way we want them. But more importantly, we should focus on that result. And I, I really think if we start to get to that shift more. And there are places that do, and sure. that's great. But I think if we really get to that shift, I think what it's going to do is you're going to suddenly realize that your teams are stronger, your folks are more comfortable, they're more confident, they're not afraid to take a chance, um, and they're also not afraid to ask you right. to kind of maybe expand on that. Or you know, if, if they know that you're okay with them doing things that may be on the boundaries in order to get the result, then they're going to do that. And, and why wouldn't I want that? Because it's only going to make your department stronger. It's going to put out a better product for the people. It's going to make your, your operations safer and, and hopefully time-wise more, more effective and efficient. So yeah. that's why I'm a big fan of, of the, the, the result and not the profit process. Dude, I love it. I love it, man. I really, really do. Um, effectiveness. Like, a ta- like, like what you just touched on is, you're in charge of people and you want them to accomplish something say, here's what I want to accomplish. Then walk away and, and say, do you need anything to get this done? Here, here it is. I give it to you. Here's the tools well, you need. Go make it yeah. happen. Be awesome. And, and you know what, too, it, this is something that we were kind of bouncing around too, is that um, we need to, to teach our folks to look forward and not look back. And what I mean by that is like, we know where we're going. Let's keep our eye on that. So for me as a, I'm a captain now, I, I shouldn't be so focused on the what the firefighters are doing or how they're doing it. Um, empower them, set the expectation, um, and then hey, let's let's get to where we're going together. And and by looking forward, I think you're going to give them that independence, and you're grooming them to take your job. And then hopefully, by you looking forward and making sure that you're you're allowing your folks to do the things that's going to make your supervisor happy suddenly you understand better and you're actually grooming yourself for the next step. So, you know, I think there's value in that. And that's the hard part of the fire service. I think at least my little bubble of it. No, no. I think your bubble is very representative of the entire bubble. So, all right, let me pull a slide up here. I got some questions coming at you. I've got, uh, yeah, I, I'm guessing, you know, a Scott McCauley, <laughs> And a David Liner. They they got a lot of stuff going on with vegetables. I'm not ignoring you guys. I'm just it's Nick's scrap, not your guys' vegetable story scrap. Um Gus Salcedo wants to know with teaching ground ladders specifically, how do you add a level of hyper realism in your training? So my ground ladder program, um, there's a lot of really good ground ladder programs out there. Magic City, um, you had OJ on here a little while ago. Um my ground ladder program isn't that high level of productivity where, um, you know, we're doing the Paxton drill and the Paxton drill was the, the hotel fire where they're throwing ladders at every window. And every time it was like whack-a-mole, every time they got somebody out, somebody else popped up and they had to keep going. My class, um, doesn't go to that. Okay. So my class is more of um, really teaching people how to use their bodies, understand that somebody that's five foot six isn't going to be able to throw the ladder that somebody that's six foot two, right? But they can do it their way. And so I work a lot to those things. And what we try to do is, is we try to use the fire ground. We use the terrain um, to, to assist and it shouldn't be the enemy. And so I, we treat ground ladders as it's almost like a game. So what can I use, you know, to, to get this ladder up if I'm not, right. you know, a six foot two, two ten muscle head, right? Nothing against muscle heads. I'm sorry, but um, I'm not one. And so I'm always looking for something, right. you know, Hey, you know, if you butt that ladder up against that parking meter, 
or the 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 seam in the sidewalk or the you know that little potted plant right that may be the amount of help that allows you to get that ladder up without muscling the thing up right or you know and the whole thing is i'm more about efficiency and so you know i know that there's a lot of folks that want to throw 35s by themselves and that's really cool if you can do it i i absolutely believe that that's a valuable skill the vast majority of the fire service for one reason or another may never get there right and and so all those things that they're going to learn and do i think have a lot of value to them um because just because you can't throw a 35 doesn't mean by yourself doesn't mean that you always should and so if I can scrape the ladder on the ground and, and stuff it up against the parked car's tire and throw that ladder, and then as I raise it, you know, spin around, so now the ladder goes down behind me, you know, is that traditional? No, but it's super safe because it, it allows the, 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 the person to throw by themselves and, and the, the ladder supported by the car tire and then the building. And, and look at me, I got the ladder up and holy cow, it's already footed. I'm not going to move it off of that tire. It's a home run. So those are the kind of things. I don't know if I really stuck to his question. If I if I deviated too far, I apologize. No, no, but no, no. You, I think you addressed it, which is mm-hmm. maximizing what you and like. No matter what your body build is, no matter what your height is, no matter what your muscle mass is, no matter what your gender is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like taking advantage of the terrain, the circumstances, what you can take advantage of. Right. And and whether you can throw a 35 by yourself or not, you're going to be more effective if you can take advantage of the terrain. Right. Well, that's the point. And again, it's it's not a shot at the guys and the girls throwing 35s by themselves. But we set up before. Once I throw the ladder up, then what do I have to do? I have to, I'm supposed to go up there and, and ventilate, do a search, VEIS, maybe do a removal or, or whatever. So um, the ladder's the beginning, not the end. And that's that's kind of how we look at it. And 100%. We have an absolute specimen on the department that can grab a three fly thirty five, throw it on his shoulder and throw it by himself, and it's impressive, man. I'm not gonna lie, yeah. and but I, there is no way in hell I could do it, and but that's not the point. The point is just being as effective as you can be, and that's right. not and, so, and not taking anything away from the specimens that can do it. Right, and so you know what we teach is, you know, maybe a little similar, but. <laughs> Instead of one person throwing a 35 by themselves, let's get it to where they can drag a 28 and a 16 to the rear by themselves mm. and then th- throw one on the ground and then stuff the butt of one up against a bush and throw that up to a second floor window. And then they get that 28 and they put it up against the fence and then they, they, they throw the fly by themselves and then lay it in. And now they've they've thrown two ladders and not only that, and still have the gas left to do something. Exactly. Up. Yeah. No. One hundred percent. I get what you're yep. saying, man. Yeah. So it's beautiful, man. Okay. Uh, Ramon. R- Ramon. Sorry. <laughs> I can't. Uh, sorry for the novel. Ha. Long story short, I have learned that having involved officers makes such a big difference in the firefighter skill set. Do you have any advice on how to create a greater acceptance to positive change in the industry? A greater acceptance to positive change. Any advice, man? One of the greatest questions ever. Right. So all those things, water boils from the bottom and all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I, my department has 300 some odd people in it or just about 300 people in it. We have um, eight stations. We have nine engines, four ladders, a rescue company. So where I'm, where I'm going with this is, you know, like I'll speak to, to ladders. We have four ladder companies, but we have four shifts. So the reality is we have 16 ladder companies. Yeah. If you think about it that yeah, way, hundred percent. And so they're very different from one shift to the next. And so you have to make, I, I say to my kids, you got to make your own fun. Well, so like brotherhood and culture, just, it's not there just waiting to, to wrap its arms around you. You have to make your own. And so I think a lot of things starts with you. And if you come in positive and open and in, industrious and you want to do good work and, and even if there's a bunch of resistance and they're all riding the, 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 the recliners or the officer never comes out of the room, go and clean something, learn something, read something, uh, you know, throw a ladder by yourself, force a door by yourself. If you have the prop, you know, um, you know, practice, you know, stretching off of a flake, you know, if, if you only have a hundred foot extra hose in the firehouse, you know, do those things. And sooner or later, somebody's going to notice, ask questions. And this is a big frustration that I have. You know, everybody wants to vilify people. And I, I can't, I'm running out of generation names, but the Y generation, right? Why, why are we doing this? Why do we do that? Well, you know what? 
good for them because they're the ones that are actually verbally asking the question. I know when I came into the fire service, I didn't have the guts to say it out loud, but I was asking those questions in my head because I didn't have the answers. Right. And so, so these folks are asking why, give them the answer. And then, and then, you know, what I do is when somebody asks me why, okay, great. This is why and we explain it, but now there's ownership to it. All right. I explained it to you. So in a shift or two or three, you know, I shouldn't see you back at zero. You should already be progressed to one. And if I don't see that, then we'll have a conversation about that. So if you want to ask why, that's great. But there's a little bit of ownership that has to be be taken in with that. So, you know, I, I think in order to develop that culture or or the the atmosphere where it's it's learning and growing, just start it on your own and and, and folks will jump in, hopefully. And then if they don't, then that's on them. But, uh, you know, one thing I said you know, long ago in my career, as much as I love being a fireman, the only way I was going to make change in my job was to get promoted because, you know, I, I could do it as a senior firefighter, but I'd have to stick around and be a senior firefighter and, and really, um, you know, work through all that process. But to be a supervisor that, that basically gave me in a very short period of time, the responsibility to create an environment that I thought would be good. And it would be one that I would want to work in myself. Dude, I love it. And one thing I want to say, and I like to say this because I hear water boils from the bottom up all the time and it, and it bugs me on a, <laughs> on a, on a, but be, it's because the reason we say that is because we put water on a stove to boil it. And that's where the heat comes from. Water will boil wherever the heat comes from. Yeah. And in the fire service, there's a lot, it's a lot easier to apply the heat when you have the rank and authority. Now that's just a fact. I mean, it is now. Can it boil from the bottom up in the fire service? Absolutely. I'm not taking anything away from um, owning owning where you're at. But anyway, that was just a minor side point. Water boils where the heat comes from. And when yeah. you have... Go ahead. Yep. So be the heat. Be the heat. You, That's you, it, you man. You can't. Like I see a lot of people complain on, on Facebook. They'll put out a thing that, oh, if you have toxic leadership, don't get mad when your people are leave or something like right, that. Right, right. Listen, I get it, but... You know, I'll speak at least in the Northeast. Um, there's not a lot of growth in the fire service. And so when you if you're fortunate enough to get a job in the Northeast, you hold on with it, hold on to it with both hands and you never let go. Um, almost regardless of how good or bad the environment is. 100%. So, um, Which is also you know, part of the problem because you're like, hey, I've been through worse. Why are you complaining? You know, but go right. Ahead. <laughs> um, and so just because of that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you got to make your own fun. Like I say to my kids, make your own fun. Um, and, and sooner or later, sooner or later, somebody will see it and, and it'll start to grow. Um, you can't blame other people for not having your spirit, your, your drive, your motivation. Um, you know, it's a complex world. And, and so be the example and smile and wave. It's all you can do. Beautiful. Dude, I didn't want to talk over it cause that was like the perfect soundbite. <laughs> Dude, yeah, all right. I know I'm serious. I just got this. I like just wrote it down. Forty two thirty six. That's the sound bite that's going to go in front of this podcast. All right. Um, I'm trying to catch you up. Uh, uh, here we go. Blah. Yeah. Okay. That's a private conversation. Some of the old heads. I'm trying to. Man, I really screwed up by not getting Kyle. Um, all right. Moving into my notes. Pulling them up for you, Nick. One second. Yep. Bridging experience with education in order to preserve the trade. So that's the first part of the bridging experience with education in order to preserve the trade. But you said mustaches and tattoos might not be enough to run a $40 million corporation. So I wanted you to expound on that for me. Right. And, and that may not be a popular statement because I'm not the mustache guy with, with the tattoos. Um, you know, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit before we went on. Um, you know, the fire service measures a lot of things by, um, you know, your action, right? And so the guys may and the girls may care if you've made a hallway, right? But your administration doesn't. And so we have to learn in 2022 how to bridge um, the needs of our employer with the needs of our community so as important as it is to have rock'em sock'em folks, tip of the spear, 
you know, mask up times are insane. You know, they can stretch holes like a demon. They can throw ladders like nobody's business, force a door just by looking at it. Um, we have to find a way to provide the structure and the career development to allow people who want to be both to be both. Because what we're finding is that we have rock and sock and firefighters that are riding the apparatus. And then in some places you have supervisors, administrators that come from a very different environment and they may not appreciate the needs of, of the line people, or they may not respect the work of the line people, but they know how to balance a budget or they know how to mm -hmm. squeeze a dollar out of one place and put it somewhere else. And, and I, I think that, you know, I'll speak for things that I've seen in my department. You know, our medicals are 80 some odd percent of our runs, and that's great. We are emergency medical responders, EMRs. We're, we're Boy and Girl Scouts with, with first aid patches, basically. But that's 80 percent of our runs. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing because I think we really do some good work in our community. But, you know, maybe we should up that a little bit. If, if, if you're going to tell me it's so important that it's 80 percent of our runs, then I, I, you know, then maybe we should put a, a higher level of, of training on that. But mm -hmm. what I'll say is I, I know that, you know, I, I live in a, or I work in a community that's full of two and a half and three story multifamily wood frame homes, balloon frame. When they burn, they burn like nobody's business and you better be good at it. Right. And so, you know, you can't say, well, we're only going to pay attention to the 80 percent because, you know, how many times does somebody really actually have a fire? Well, if they have one time in their lifetime. And that's that's huge to them. So we have to find ways to, to balance all those requirements out. And so training budgets should be a little bit more robust. A respect for the folks that are, are good at fighting fires should, should be a little bit more. The the desire to cultivate a culture that encourages folks to be good at fighting fires should be there. Um, and they should be able to have the ability to stand in a boardroom or wherever and justify the need for the personnel on the apparatus or the reason for that engine or that truck on that certain community. Um, because it's easy, you know, they, you know, in my community, it's about a million to a million and a half per company. So they say, oh, we need a million dollars from the fire department. Well, easy math. It's not hard to say, oh, look, we're going to close engine, whatever. Um, but, you know, administrators should be better prepared for that. And when you bring folks up through the ranks that don't have the skills um, to, to, to compete in that environment, then that's why, unfortunately, I think we have decisions made that don't fit the mm. needs of our agency. No, no, no. And uh, you touch on something that that's so I, I think it's one of the, the biggest problems in the modern America fire service. And that is the people that should be in the leadership. I'm trying to word this the right way. So bear with me, Nick. The people yeah. that should be wearing the five bugles, the four bugles, right? They don't want the job. And and maybe it's because they don't have the skill sets to fulfill the jobs. Because that's a point I've never really thought about before. You know what I'm saying? But um, I think that's a major problem in the American Fire Service is the, the people that should be the chiefs don't want the job. Well, right. Go ahead. But also... I think, you know, and I'll speak for my job specifically, no, but I think it's, it's a regional problem in New England that oftentimes the junior promotee gets the straight day admin gig and there's there's no no perk to it other than, oh, well, you wanted to get promoted, didn't you? So now you're the admin captain or, or whatever, admin lieutenant or the public education officer. Um, you know, so immediately it's spun with a stink and that's, that's a disservice to the community. It's a disservice to the fire department and the rest of the membership. Um, you know, there are places that, that treat those promotions with much more, you know, more care, mm. um, and, and they show value to it. And so those, in those places, sometimes those promotions are actually more widely sought out because they want to do those jobs because they see that there's value not only for their personal career, but for the betterment of the organization. Um, and then when they do those things, just by default, they learn things about, you know, even just sending emails sometimes or, or budgeting, even if it's a small thing, um, you know, th that can be built upon. 
right. right? When you're just riding an apparatus, tooting a horn, swinging you know, axes, and swinging and hoses, eating. yeah. Right. As important as it is, you know, a lot of times that gets lost. You know, the other thing too is, you know, we just need to to respect both sides. You know, and and um, you know, I have aspirations to some bit someday be you know either a deputy or or, or higher. Nice. Um, but folks don't in my agency, and that's fine. But don't crap all over those people. And at the same time, when folks finally do hop the fence and become, you know, a straight day gig, don't forget where you came from, and don't crap all over those folks. And remember that you know, if one or two people are very vocal about not liking you. There's probably a whole lot of people that actually do appreciate your effort. They're just not saying anything. Well, oh man, dude, you're getting into some really, really close to home stuff. Uh, Cause you really have to ask, why aren't they saying anything? You have to ask that question. Well, you mean like, Hey, good job. Or thanks for getting us. The no, toilet like, paper? like no hundred percent. Why are they not saying anything? Well, I think, I think, um, yeah, it's it's that's this is a crazy rabbit hole, but no, I mean, no, there's no doubt about it. Some people think that that stuff just happens, like it's it just this, everything just shows up, and it, that's just not the case. I mean, it actually takes a fair amount of work just to to get the gear to grind a little bit, you know. Um, I, I think it's it's just an awareness, like we don't do a good job of of teaching people or explaining to people what the other folks are doing, and I also think, look, you've got a shelf life. Right. And so in the Northeast, a lot of fire chiefs are hired for five years. So, you know, you, you spend a year or two trying to figure it out. You spend that third year, a little bit of rock'em sock'em. And then the fourth and fifth year, you're like, man, I'm tired of this. Right. Beat you up. <laughs> and so, no doubt. So, you know. But, okay. No, it's fair. Yeah. That's fair, man. No, I, it's a lot of wisdom coming out, out of this. Uh, uh, I, I can be full of crap because I'm only a captain. So, um, I don't know. It's just, just observations, right? No. And, and that's all we're doing is discussing mine and your, I'm, I'm a battalion. So I have never sat in a, in a, in a big chief's office. So, and I, I never will. I can say that with a hundred percent authenticity. Um, let me see if I missed anything. There's a ton of conversation going on besides the point, but no real questions coming. If you have questions, throw them at us. Um, all right. Next question that we had planned or to discuss. It is NIOSH reports. These are dynamic, nonlinear events that are hard to capture. We need to learn, not judge. Right. So uh, full disclosure, we did have um, a double line of duty death in, in my department back in 2010 um, at a fire. Um, one of our best firefighters uh, of the generation. And so, you know, I think that was a shock enough. Um, and, and he lost his proby as well. Uh, just a wonderful, two wonderful people, just a very tragic situation. Um, and so, you know, it was at a, a two and a half story wood frame, multiple dwelling it's, it's, we do this all the time. So I, I think, um, going through the aftermath and seeing how the process unfolds with, um, your NIOSH folks, our Connecticut state police. Um, our administration, you realize pretty quick that um, to arrive at, you know, your your NIOSH document, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. You know, I, I think, you know, they are not linear events. They're very dynamic. There's a lot of things going on at once. Um, there's also a lot of things based upon either time compression or a lack of awareness or, you know, people on the scene, it's, it's well-documented auditory exclusion. Right. Um, they, they think they're doing things at a certain time and, and then they think that they said things or didn't say things or they heard things or didn't hear things. And so it's very hard to unravel the event when you take, you know, um, the, the, the eyewitness accounts, the folks that were there, whatever statements they have, then you layer that on top of radio transmissions, and then you try to bring all these other things together, it becomes very difficult. And so, um, you know, I learned personally that, you know, I used to read NIOSH reports a certain way, and now I kind of understand that um, I'm better suited just to, to look at them and appreciate the sacrifice of not only those individual or individuals, but the department. And then try to take 
what I get from that and layer it onto my department and see how I could, I could be better. Nice. Um, nice. You know, there's some things that like, you know, it's not a 100% factual document because it's very impossible. It's, it's near impossible to get all the information. Um, and then it's also near impossible to get accurate accounts. And then I think one thing that um, was striking for me, because I wasn't at this fire was, um, you know, all your friends are there. And so you're trying to figure out, Hey, what happened? Right. And, right. you know, um, you know, I don't want to say you want to blame somebody because two people died, but damn, you're looking for like, why did this happen? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, yeah. when all your friends are there, it makes it very difficult to arrive at some solid conclusions. Um, and, and so it's, it's tough. So, uh, you know, I think when we, we look at some of these things, like there's, you know, a bunch of landmark ones like, um, you know, Arizona, Brett Tarver, sure. um, you know, we get the Denver drill, uh, with Langbart and, um, you know, Worcester, um, you know, it's easy to say, I would never do that. Right. Or I can't believe that guy did that. Well, guess what? If you ask my two buddies, they would tell you they would never do that too, whatever that was. You know, because things happen in real time and you react. And I think one of the frustrations and a lot of people have said it is that people read these NIOSH reports and they know how it's going to end. Well, the people there were that people that were there that day didn't know it was going to end that way. And so they made decisions based upon, you know, the incomplete, the partial information that they had, their understanding of the situation as it stood and their their responsibilities and their roles. And so, you know, I, I think we just need to, to look at NIOSH reports and, and really respect the fact that um, this is our, um, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of like our craft's best effort to try to get better. And it's not uh, a way to blame because there's, I'm sure there's plenty of blame to go around on right, all of them, right. but we're not the ones that should be doing it. So hmm. I think that's really where, you know, how I see it. No, and I don't even want to bring, but but uh, I just finished watching season one of Ted Lasso, and he finishes that whole thing with learn to be curious, not to judge when he's throwing the darts. I don't know if you've seen Ted Lasso or not. doesn't matter. It's a comedy. So that's the reason I hesitate to bring it up when we're talking about a serious subject. But the whole point of his whole thing was you got to learn to be curious and not judgmental. And, and, it's, and it's basically exactly what you're saying. We got to learn to be curious. And curious might not be the right word. I like I like the way you stated it better. We have to learn. We, we're trying to learn, not judge. Right. You know, um, and not to belabor it and, and not to, to, to step in the waters I don't belong. But, you know, I'll speak about, you know, any of those NIOSH reports. If we were fortunate enough to ask those folks why they did what they did, uh, you know, they wouldn't have done what what they did. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just how it is. I think one of the big factors that we, we can't quantify very well in those reports is environmental stressors. Like specifically the day that, that we had our fire, it was one of the hottest, most humid days that I can recall in my adult life. And then also too, and, and this is what's so good about some of the training that's going on today is that, that folks are being exposed to stress, physical and mental that we don't understand the the places that people go when they're exposed to high levels of heat when they're we're working at max capacity and beyond and maybe they're low air so now they're or no air and now they're in a toxic environment and that does things to your body that you just cannot replicate in a training environment right and so um you know i mean that the, the one to, that I think everybody can kind of think about is the actions that Brett Tarver took, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not fighting, gonna, actually going physically right, fighting the people trying know, to save him. So um, that's just not normal. Right. And yeah, that should show you us, everyone that the, the stressors that we um, face when we start to get pushed towards the dark corners, um, are very big and very real. And, and, and how do you, how do you, how do you even begin to try and replicate something like that? You know, a, a place where I, I don't even, well, yeah, it's a challenge. Right. I mean, if we bring it all the way back to the beginning, you're not with a guy standing there with a clipboard, checking off little boxes on right. a JPR, right. taking 20 minutes to pop a door. Right. 
right? That's that that may be the the problem with the fire service. Or saying or saying you're not allowed to fail them because they took 20 minutes to pop the door. Right. We we've deviated so far from what the mission actually is that you know it's just feel good stuff to say that we've got folks in uniform that can do something when right. the bell hits. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, we went down some rabbit holes already. Yeah, no doubt. Evening. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I love it, man. I really do. It's been I think it's been a good conversation. Um, I okay. want to throw at you book book or books that you think firefighters should be reading. Well, so you know, it's funny, I tried to be original here. Um it's very hard I, after I this a, many and there, a lot of I read a lot. But, okay. Um you know what I would say is that um, the fire department training network, um, mm. for 60 bucks, not only does it support you as a firefighter, but it supports that organization to a lot of them to put on the training that they, they do. It's at the highest level that anybody, um, you know, as far as realism anyway, maybe that's how you do it is, is we look more towards the FDTN and, and look at that as a model and, and, and span it out at a national level. But anyway, um, what I tell a lot of the new folks when they first get on the job, is to subscribe to that. I know 60 bucks on a starting firefighter salary is a bit much. Um, but then I also tell them you're going to save money when I tell you to buy Tim Collette's operating and stretch, stretching and operating the first hand line. Because for, for new folks, I think that that's a, a good value and, it, and it's going to teach them some stuff awesome. um, awesome. that they really should be getting at. Um, you had it on here a while ago. It's a book called The Fires. It's by Joe Flood. And what it is, it's about the warriors from the other side. And I, I think it kind of goes with what we talked about earlier. The Rand Corporation was brought in by the city of New York to try to figure out how to handle the, the fire service. And, you know, I, I think when we, we read about the war years um, from that perspective, it does kind of answer some things. And I, I think what it allowed for me to do in, in our, quote, modern time, whatever, is that I, it gave me a greater understanding for the effects that government and, and folks that are not in my fire department have on on the way i with the resources i have and how i can deliver our product um and then so if you want to dovetail that with report from engine company 82 mm-hmm. i think that's a really good yin and yang really hard to on, um, on that problem right on. that they faced back then so and then i got a plug uh nick papa his coordinated ventilation mm-hmm. book um absolutely a home run um i think that um that book uh you kind of talked about it earlier um you know when you see something you know it's good but you just don't know the impact that it's going to have right i i do believe that folks are going to be reading that book in 5 10 15 20 30 years and it's still going to be relevant then so that's a good one 100 percent. yep and then uh, uh, deep survival lawrence gonzalez um that book i used a lot after we had our our situation in mm-hmm. 2010 because it, it kind of gave me a an idea a little bit of how how that stuff works but and i'm a big jocko fan as well so love it Love it. Uh, FDTN. I, and this is a side story because I took my stack of FDTN. Uh, what, have, what, what do you want to call them? Newsletters? I, yeah. They're not quite magazines. They're not quite. Right. But, but I took them up to the station and I'm like, hey, here's the deal. I want to share this with everybody up here. But I also, it's like my comic book collection. I don't want to lose them. I don't want them to be thrown away, thrown in the trash or tossed right. to the side. So here's the deal. I'm putting them here. Take care of them. And anyway, so FDTN, yeah. so huge fan. Go ahead. What's what's beautiful about FDTN is that um, Jim McCormick, he'll only bring folks in that he's vetted, right? Here we are vetted again. Um, and then also that they can – the beauty about being a good instructor is that you don't have to, like, wrap it up in all sorts of crazy words and 15 pages and, and all this explanation. The vast majority of his articles that, that they produce um, are a page, two pages, yes. page and a half. Um, and so it's it really keeps the attention of the firefighter um, and, and, long enough to and give them what they need. He doesn't put out anything that he doesn't believe. And so it's like he – I don't want to say like just trust him blindly, but it is the one thing I read and I don't worry about going and checking and seeing. It, it is literally that – that is how good it is. So Right. Yep. Um, and one other book only nope. because um, – a lot of what I taught or, or going through teaching folks uh, truck positioning and all that stuff. Um, Tom Brennan's Random Thoughts uh, mm. from Penwell. Um, articles are very similar in length and to the point. Um, and so there's a lot of good information in there um, that I used. And I say it all the time when I teach the class um, that 
that I think has value for, for new folks and even experienced operators um, to, to really kind of allow them to, to broaden their, their understanding of, of why they're parking here and, yes. and how positioning can, can be done and all that, supporting those operations. So that's a good book. Beautiful. That's Beautiful. a good book. Dude, a great, great list. All right. And a lot of people agreed. Amanda Miller said boss books. Put a like on that. All right. Yeah. Star sent in. Re- yes. Let me see what it, Tony, Tony, I'm reading your thing. Hold on. All right, here we go. We have a thing. It's called the next five questions for firefighters. It was originally the five questions for firefighters, but now we're here. So my question to you, Nick Esposito is, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? I think I am. All right, here we go. Number one, what single characteristic makes the difference between a run of the mill firefighter and the top tier go to badass firefighter. So I'll, I'll, my perspective will be from somebody that's new and they can use it to evolve through their career. Okay. Have a natural curiosity. So what I mean by that is constantly question, ask why it doesn't mean be lazy and have somebody else answer your questions, go out and find the answers. Um, be, be comfortable with learning something new. Don't be afraid to fail. Um, you know, the more comfortable, the sooner that you are comfortable with failing, um, the, the world's going to open up for you. And so having that natural curiosity, um, I think will allow folks to be, um, much more useful on the fire ground because it will go to that, um, the results based performance instead of just process, because they're going to have the, the tools to adapt and, and to modify and, and, and to move on and, and analyze. So. Natural curiosity. Natural curiosity. I love it. 1,000% I love it. I give it cool. max points right out the gate because – I forgot about the points. I forgot about the <laughs> points. Now the pressure's on. No, pressure is definitely on. But, no, 100%. And it's, it's uh, be curious, not judgmental. I love that, man. I really do, and I don't know. But, yeah, excellent answer. If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? Don't discard anybody. Take um, anything that somebody wants to share with you, take it in. You can filter it, but don't put yourself in a position where you're putting up barriers. Um, this job is is going to be over before you know it, and you're mm-hmm. surrounded by people that have been here before you, and even the folks that you may not think they have any fire sense at all, sometimes the disenfranchised are the most observant. And so you may learn things from them. You may not learn how to make a hallway or the, the whiz bang trick to force a door, but you may learn some perceptions, some, some things that are allow you to be more perceptive or, or to really have observations about things. So, so take in everything that everybody says, don't discard everybody. Everybody should have credibility. Love it. Don't discard everyone. Learn from them. Number three, what is your favorite training drill? Um, I'm a fan of anything that's open-ended. And, and so I think that's what allows folks to, to, to work on the result oriented training. And so I, I, it drives me nuts when somebody will stop a drill halfway through because they did it wrong. Well, no, they didn't do it wrong. They did it their way. Right. And then let's see if they get the results. So for me, really, you know, I really do like open-ended drills. Um, sometimes they take more time to develop. And, right. And I was going to ask, how well, long, how long do you allow it to be open-ended? Right. Because it, it sounds like you might just be like being a lazy instructor and now oh, let's see what they do. It's really not the case. If you, if you set conditions to it, up to, to, to allow them to work towards the result that you're looking for. Right. Then, then sometimes that's the best way. And, and that's going to allow them to really get back to that. When am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And, and all that. So I, I like open-ended drills. So that's why I like truck positioning is so good. One of our, um, he's a captain now, but as a Lieutenant, he used to say, Hey, um, take the third right and then set up on the fifth house on the left. Nobody knows what that house is. It's open ended, and then holy cow, it could be the easiest setup or the worst setup in a hundred years. Right. But let's see what they do. Dude, love it, love it. Yep. Open ended. Uh, number four. What mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? <laughs> well, I, I wish I learned from it because I still do it. I don't. I don't shut up, <laughs> and I don't. I don't have patience. Um, and and um, and it's it's it gets me in trouble. 
it's it's definitely um, limited opportunity for me. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, just slowing down, being patient, listening, um, man, it's tough. Then I'm, I don't know if I'm ever going to get it right, that's, <laughs> but that's, that's what I got. Just patient, slow down and listening. Yeah. It's, man. There's a hundred percent. If I, if I could identify with anything more than that, I don't think I could. So I'll give you max points on that hundred percent. Thank you. Final <laughs> question is heavy fire searchable space now you're a ladder guy so i think i know where this yeah. is going but would you rather be assigned i want to hear your answer to yeah. the nozzle or first in on a ves well since we're having this conversation here tonight i'm going to say i'm i'm going to take the nozzle because i've been on a ladder or a rescue for a while now and i kind of miss miss the, the engine work. and so my <laughs> the reason why i kind of gravitated away from the engines is we have nine of them and we have four ladder trucks, so I was kind of trying to up my odds. Right but on. now you're telling me my engine's going to the fire. I'm taking the nozzle. Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not expect that answer. I'll be yeah. honest with you. No. With there truck you tactics hanging behind your head. I know. It's, I was I know. not it's, expecting it's that. All, I'm a fraud. Here's That's the deal. It. Because yeah. because the honesty, I will give that one max points also. All right. So Thank there you. it is. Officially, uh, the next five questions for firefighters, according to Nick Esposito, uh, and officially 128 scraps in the books. Uh, if someone wants to get a hold of you, best way to do so? Um, Instagram, uh, truck underscore tactics. Facebook, I think it's truck tactics. I have a website. It's uh, trucktactics.org. My email is trucktactictraining at gmail.com. Not hard. Right um, on. Right on. Yeah. So Beautiful. Uh, Thank you. Firehousevigilance.com. If you love the scrap, go there. Support it. Uh, I do not ever want to sit here and read ads, uh, but, but I want to keep the scrap going. Go there, support the scrap. Uh, I want to apologize personally and deeply and from the bottom of my heart to Orlando Fire Conference. I was going to go there and teach uh, the leadership, nine L's of leadership class. And because of the ice storm that hit Oklahoma, it literally hit the day I was flying out. And like as soon as it didn't matter that I could fly, flight started opening up again. That's just... I could not make a worse schedule for the flight. So I want to apologize to everybody in Orlando. I missed and, and deeply regret it. Um, but next up, Wednesday, me and the wife flying out North Florida Fire Expo. Really excited because we love Florida, obviously. Um, if you want to catch, catch a class there, I look forward to that. A lot of the people from Orlando will be there, so I'm really excited to see them. On the scrap, we got, here's March. We're leading off with Steve Stowecki, then Mike Galliano. Rob Fisher, and then Chief David Rhodes. That's March. So we closing out February with Esposito and Truck Tactics, and then that's the March. So, yeah, I'm super excited. I can't, I cannot deny it. Um, I think that's everything I've got. March is going to be epic. If you see me anywhere, I want to get pictures with you. It's one of my main things. I never ask for pictures. My wife, I, I'm terrible at it. So if you see me, say, hey, let's get a picture. Absolutely, I want to do it. Um, there we go. Yes, yes. Absolutely done. Mutts, don't scrap. Everybody, number 128, Nick Esposito. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Everybody else, I hope the tones stay silent. Unless it's burning, stay safe.